gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. Glory be to you, O Lord. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of the Lord. And grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Today I want to start out by asking you to think back on the last time you watched the Super Bowl. The last few seconds of the game as the clock counts down and, and then the game's over and music blares throughout the stadium, banners and confetti and streamers are all over the place floating in the air. There's all kinds of noise and commotion on the field. Anybody who's, you know, everybody who's anybody's down there, you have thousands of flashbulbs going off from cameras and phones. Reporters are trying to get a little 20-second soundbite from the players, but you can barely hear them over all the noise, right? Speeches are given, certain players are highlighted and honored, and then the big prize is brought out, right? It's lifted up so everyone can see it and it's passed around. It's what they get for the, their accomplishment, right? It symbolizes all of their hard work. They now have something to show for it. And what is it? A big shiny hunk of metal, right? <laughs> a trophy. Or, or maybe they get a hunk of metal to put on their, their finger, right? A flashy ring. That's what the world sees, right? That's what's lifted up. Which is kind of strange because, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, what does a trophy really matter anyway, right? I mean, sure, it'll... It'll mean something for a little while, but eventually the significance will fade after a few years, a couple of decades. The, it'll be a distant memory. We'll just collect dust. Yeah, it's strange sometimes the things that are lifted up for the world to see. And what about your life, too? I mean, what are the things that you sometimes lift up for the world to see about you? You want the world to see you in light of these things. It's not a trophy. Maybe it is some accomplishment or your career, your job, or maybe it's something you own, a nice car, or a really big house. Maybe it's the money you have in the bank, or, or maybe it's your heritage, right? Your family name, where you come from. Maybe it's the accomplishments of your children or your grandchildren that you wear as a badge of pride for everyone to see, or maybe it's the land you own, or, or maybe it's even your volunteerism, the, the amount of charitable things you do, right? It's these things that you hold up and you want to see, you want the world to see you in light of it. What are the things you lift high? You see, in our gospel lesson today, Jesus is addressing that question. But what Jesus will tell his disciples, what they are to do as his disciples, to lift high, make their life all about, is going to be something very different than the world would ever choose. Jesus is going to tell his disciples that they're to lift up a cross. Now, you know, there's, there's different kinds of crosses that we probably need to distinguish between today as, as we discuss Jesus' words. I mean, first of all, there is the cross, right? Capital T-H-E, capital C-R-O-S-S, -S, right? The cross, the cross, Jesus' cross that he died upon. The cross that he bore, the cross that he was lifted up upon 
cross that ultimately spells out all of God's wrath and judgment and condemnation for sin. The sin of the world. Your sin. <laughs> and this is the kind of cross, this is the cross that you and I would never want to carry. <laughs> we couldn't carry it, even if we tried. First of all, we don't like it. Like I said, it reminds us that we're sinners. And I don't think we normally like to admit that about ourselves. Oh, sure, we're happy to, to admit that we're not perfect, that we don't always live up to God's expectations, but, but we're not that bad, right? In fact, that's why we like to lift up a lot of the things we do in our lives. You know, we want the world to see the good things we've done. And we do this a lot of times in our religious life, right? We lift up our good works, our kind deeds, our religious activities. Look what I do. We want everyone to see. We especially want God to see pretty good people. And yet, what does the Bible say? The Bible says things like Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short. Or the Bible says in, in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18.20, he who sins is the one who shall die. We could, we could lift up all the good things about our lives till kingdom come. We could wave them around, but it wouldn't do us a lick of good. We're sinners who have fallen short. We have no ability to have a relationship with God. We only deserve His condemnation. We are naturally His enemies, the Scriptures say. We've fallen short. But then, of course, the cross also represents the unexplainable, mysterious, incredible, amazing good news of the gospel, right? That in great mercy, God provided someone to hang upon that cross for us, right? To receive, in other words, God's judgment and wrath for our sin. The Holy One, the Righteous One, God's own Son. In Christ, it's been satisfied. In Christ, it's been meted out. In Christ, it's a done deal. And so as Christians, then, of course, we live in Christ, the Scriptures say. Everything about who we are as God's people is centered in Christ. We worship God through Christ. We, we are a family of God in Jesus Christ. We have eternal life in Christ. Apart from Christ, there's only death and condemnation and damnation. But in Christ, there is mercy and there is grace and there is eternal life. And all of that Christ accomplished for us on the cross. And so, yeah, of course, rightly so, then, we're going to lift high Jesus' cross. We want the world to see that. We want the world to see God's love in Jesus Christ. That he died for our sins, that he died for their sins. It is our salvation. It is the emblem of our hope as God's people. And so that's Jesus' cross, a cross we couldn't carry on our own. But then there's another type of cross. And this is the type of cross that Jesus is actually talking about in our text today when he tells his disciples, if any of you would come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Not his cross, but your cross. I mean, Jesus refers to individual crosses that we as his disciples will carry. And he's not calling his disciples here to go get a, two by, a couple two-by-fours and nail them together. No, it's not. we're not talking about a physical cross, a literal cross. No, instead, this cross that he's referring to is... Is all the difficulties, all the suffering, all the frustration, all the trouble that we're going to face at times in our lives simply because we are Jesus' disciples. We are in Christ. And you know, I think this type of cross and can be divided into three different categories. Remember today I said we're going to talk about four kinds of crosses. Jesus' cross, and then three kinds of crosses that we might be called to carry as his disciples. The first one is the most serious. Most definitely the one Jesus is, is pointing out to the 12 disciples. Because they're going to experience this cross. The cross of persecution. The cross of rejection. And why? Because they dare to preach the gospel. They're going to go out into a world that's going to be very hostile to the message of Jesus Christ crucified. Indeed, it, this cross might often even lead to martyrdom itself. Dying for the faith. All of the disciples will experience this. Many of them will die, specifically because of their faith. 
be martyred. Peter, we're told, was crucified, but he chose to be hung upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner as the Lord. But Christians even today still suffer this kind of cross at various times and in various places around the world because they live maybe in a culture or a community that rejects everything that Jesus stands for. We as Americans, thankfully, don't normally have to deal with this kind of cross, although I think maybe you and I sometimes find ourselves sort of kind of holding our breath here lately, right? As, as we see our own culture seem to grow increasingly hostile to the Christian faith. So that's the first kind of cross that a Christian may have to carry. Then there's a second kind of cross, and, and this one, I think, refers more to just the general kind of difficulties and hardships and suffering and pain that we might experience. Just because this is a broken world, it's not the way God intended it to be. It's a world that's full of broken things, things like disease, you know, cancer or Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's disease, etc., etc., COVID-19. A world where things like car accidents happen or natural disasters like hurricanes or, or tornadoes. A world where there's chronic pain, right? Where it just doesn't go away. Where there's poverty or, or unemployment. And yeah, while these kinds of things happen to everybody, whether they're a believer or not, even so, these are the kinds of things that can sometimes really cause a Christian to walk away from the faith, to doubt God and His good and gracious will and His love for them. These are the kinds of crosses that are real easy to set down and just walk away. I mean, think about what it must be like, you know, when you're suffering maybe from some kind of disease or chronic pain or, or some big problem and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray that God will take it away, but, but you get no... <laughs> response, right? Or, or maybe you determine that it is God's will that you, you suffer in this way. That can be a really hard cross to bear. And yet, Jesus bore this kind of cross. We hear in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to his Father, Lord, if Father, if it be your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. But then Jesus prayed the hardest prayer of all. Father, not my will, but thy will. Yes, suffering and sickness and pain can be a real cross, a heavy cross that Christians may have to carry. And yet, you know, God has a way of working through sometimes the strangest circumstances to give His people an opportunity to lift high and glorify what He's done in Jesus Christ. And, and sometimes I think it's this kind of cross because it can be so common you and I get the privilege of showing the world the medal of our faith. I mean, the, some of the biggest inspirations for me in, in my own faith walk are, are those Christians who, who bear this kind of heavy cross, deal with this kind of suffering. I mean, I know I've said it before, but my parents are examples to me in this way. My, my mom's had multiple sclerosis for almost 30 years, you know, been confined to a wheelchair, lost, losing the ability to use her body, you know, to do simple things even like eat. And yet, despite all the reasons she has to be bitter about it, to the Lord especially, instead she's one of the strongest Christians I know, and always so joyful and thankful for every day. My dad, um, he's her caregiver, and I've never known uh, someone who shows such Christ-like love. You know, being there and patiently caring for her in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. Just showing Christ-like commitment and faithfulness. You see, in simply burying their cross in faith like this, they, they show the love of Christ more than, than they could if they painted the words on their house. Indeed, it might be a cross that you have to carry one day, an opportunity to show the world your faith in Jesus Christ, that you follow the Lord no matter what. Now, finally, there's a third type of cross that I think we carry as disciples. And this is, this is a more regular cross. I mean, I think every Christian, no matter what, is going to have to carry a cross like this, this third type. You might call this just the daily cross of being a Christian. All 
all the little disciplines, all the little things, the opportunities, the words that we say, the attitude that we have each and every day that shows the world who we truly are and who we truly follow. Little things, right? But though they be little, I think sometimes this is the cross that's easiest to ignore. I mean, it could be something as simple as just setting aside Sunday morning as a devoted time to the Lord, right? A time to be in worship. Let's be honest, that's getting harder and harder for Christians to do, to simply devote Sunday morning to the Lord. Or not supporting political candidates or parties or businesses that openly promote ungodly ideas or ideologies or laws. It could be sending our children to Sunday school or making sure they're involved in some kind of Christian education, that they're diligent in confirmation class and, and studying their materials. It could be something as simple as supporting our church with time, treasures, and talents, right? In other words, all of these are ways that we show the people around us who we follow and who we're invested in. It's a type of cross that can be really easy just to set down because we can be so busy and distracted by so many other things. In fact, I think some of these crosses are even more obscure than the ones I mentioned. It could be something as simple as just reading our Bibles regularly and doing devotions. Or joining and participating in a Bible study. How many Christians actually belong to a Bible study where they discuss with other Christians or learn from their pastor or another Christian about God's Word? It could be intentionally doing devotions or having spiritual discussions, religious discussions with our spouse or our children in an intentional way. It could be praying with people regularly. And I don't mean, you know, they come up to you and they tell you about their problems. And you're like, okay, I'll pray for you. I mean saying, let's pray right now. And taking their hand and showing them who you truly believe has the power to address the troubles that beset them. It could be talking with your neighbor, literally. The people who live around you about your faith or about your Savior or how they need your Savior, too. Inviting others to church. Or... Shoot, it could be something as simple as what we read in our epistle lesson today. I mean, notice the first few words that Paul tells us is, let love be genuine. Well, Jesus tells us what genuine love is. It's bearing a cross, right? Greater love hath no one than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. So Paul goes on then to show us what genuine love or cross-like love is in the life of the Christian. And this long list of, of simple things, and yet let's be honest, some of them are the hardest things to do. To not be wise in our own sight, to not repay evil with evil, to not avenge ourselves, to live peaceably with others, not to curse our enemies, but to pray for them, to love them. Yeah, bearing the cross in this way, even in these simple daily ways, can probably be some of the hardest crosses of all to bear. They're not heavy. But like I said, so easy to set down. Or just so easy to think, like I said, that we're too busy. We got too much else going on. Or we're just not into it. Or we're interested in doing something a little different. Or we feel embarrassed. Maybe it's just too much of a burden. And so we shy away from these crosses, I think, most of all, just because it means we actually have to take notice of other people around us. And, how, and consider how we might bring the gospel to them and share with them the love of Christ. I mean, how many of you know whether the people you work with, or if you're an employer, how many of your employees, you know, that are, are Christians or go to church regularly? And if you do know that there are some there who are unchurched, unchristian, then what, are, what is your plan for lifting high the cross and leading them to Christ? Or if you're a teacher or a daycare worker, you know, do you know how many kids in your class are unchurched or their family is unchurched and, and not regularly in the Word? If so, if there are kids in your class like this, then what are you going to do? What's your plan for lifting high the cross and leading them and their family into God's house? How many of you have grandkids or family members who don't practice the faith anymore? What's your plan for picking up the cross and showing them the way back to the Savior? Do you have a plan? If yes, then pick up that cross and go. If no, then maybe it's time to count the cost again about what it means to be a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know questions like this are hard. <laughs> they 
it does mean having to be so intentional. But remember Jesus' first words about discipleship. You cannot be my disciple unless you first, what? Deny yourself and then take up your cross and follow me. If we can't even bear little simple crosses like this third category, how can we ever hope to actually bear a heavier cross if the Lord should ever later in life lay one of those other crosses upon us? How could we ever bear the cross if it means our own life? So let me ask you again in closing. What do you lift high in your own life? Is it the strange things that this world would lift up? Well, if so, just remember trophies gather dust. Cars, no matter how expensive they are, eventually break down. Careers and jobs will eventually come to an end. But you and I, we know better. We lift high something far greater. We lift high the cross. The cross on which Christ carried, right? So that all the world can see the love of God. And then our own individual cross as the Lord gives it to, to us to carry. We pick up these crosses of life and faith and follow Jesus every day. In his name, amen.